hearing, I call this hearing to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. I want to thank everyone, especially our witness for joining us today. Let me begin by saying that standing house and committee rules and practice will continue to apply during remote proceedings. All members are reminded that they are expected to adhere to these standing rules, including decorum, when they are participating in any remote event. With that said, the technology we are utilizing today requires us to make some small modifications to ensure that the members can fully participate in these proceedings. House regulations require members to be visible through a video connection throughout the proceeding. So please keep your cameras on. If you have to participate in another proceeding, please exit and log back in later. In the event a member encounters technical issues that prevent them from being recognized for their questioning, I will move to the next available member of the same party. And I will recognize that member at the next appropriate time slot provided they have returned to the proceeding. Should a member's time be interrupted by technical issues, I will recognize that member at the next appropriate spot for the remainder of their time once their issues have been resolved. In the event a witness loses connectivity during testimony or questioning, I will preserve their time as staff address the technical issue. I may need to research the proceedings to provide time for the witness to reconnect. And finally, remember to remain remain muted until you are recognized to minimize background noise. In accordance, in accordance with the rules, staff have been advised to mute participants only in the event there is inadvertent background noise. Should a member wish to be recognized, they must unmute themselves and seek recognition at the appropriate time. Before we get started, let me take a minute to welcome our newest member, Troy Carter from the Second District of Louisiana. Mr. Carter is a dedicated public servant, having enjoyed a distinguished career at nearly every level of state and local government. He previously served in both the Louisiana House and Senate, and also as New Orleans City Councilman. Mr. Carter has a track record as a successful entrepreneur. We think this will serve him well and our committee, and I look forward to working with him. Welcome, Mr. Carter. Administrator Guzman, welcome to the Small Business Committee, and thank you for being here today. First and foremost, I want to commend you for the tremendous work you have done for our nation's small businesses. And it is important to point out that you took over the helm of SBA in the midst of an unprecedented crisis for our nation's small firms. In 2020, COVID-19 closed more businesses than any other year on record and left countless other entrepreneurs clinging for their survival. I appreciate the fact that you're here today in compliance with statute. Unfortunately, Treasury Secretary Yellen has declined to appear before us in complete disregard for the law, which requires her to do so. Without her at the table, this committee cannot properly fulfill our oversight responsibilities to American taxpayers nor the nation's entrepreneurial community. While she and her team may believe the role in PPP and other small business COVID relief programs is dwindling as we move toward economic growth and economic rebirth, they are sorely mistaken. In light of the feedback we have received about the MOU between Treasury and SBA, it is incumbent upon Secretary Yellen to fulfill her statutory requirement and appear before this committee. I look forward to working with Chair Cardin and Ranking Members Luca Meyer and Senator Paul to find a mutually agreed upon date for Secretary Yellen to appear before uh, our committee with Administrator Guzman in the near, near future. Congress has passed 
eight small business relief bills, allocating more than $1 trillion to small firms during their darkest hour. The federal government's efforts to save small business were extraordinary, but distributing this aid was a monumental task for SBA. The $1 trillion plus in federal funding represented more than 10 times SBA's annual budget. As a result, the agency administered more aid during the COVID crisis than it had for all the other disasters combined during its 67 year history. To that end, it is important to recognize SBA employees for their tireless work in getting these programs up and running. The agency's efforts made an undeniable impact on entrepreneurs' lives and helped millions of small businesses and nonprofits avoid permanent closure. And yet, the massive scale of PPP and other relief programs, coupled with a quick rollout, overwhelmed the agency at times and resulted in a number of problems. And my hope for today is that we will not blame, but instead work constructively in a bipartisan manner to assess the current programs and partner with SBA to make improvements where needed. One of my top priorities has been increasing equity in relief programs. Early on, evidence emerged showing the smallest of firms weren't getting the same access as their larger counterparts with ties to big banks. That is why I fought hard for PPP modifications last year. Additionally, under, uh, under the Biden administration, SBA has taken deliberate action to deliver relief to underserved communities. These efforts have proven to be effective in reaching those that were left behind in the initial round of PPP. With the current round of PPP, SBA has approved more than 6 million loans for a total of nearly $266 billion with an average loan size of approximately 44,000. This is a substantial improvement compared to an average loan size of $199,000 during the first round of PPP in 2020. I also look forward to hearing more about the targeted IDLE program, Restaurant Revitalization Fund, and the Shorter Venue Operating Grant Program three new programs that are awarding direct grants to small firms hit hard by the pandemic. Another issue that has plagued both PPP and IDLE has been fraud and abuse. Unfortunately, to get loans out the door, the previous administration lowered guardrails and fostered an environment ripe with fraud and abuse. GAO added PPP and IDLE to its annual high risk list in March of this year, meaning there is need, there is a need for better management and oversight. I am pleased that under your leadership, the agency has confronted these issues head on. It is vital that the SBA combats fraud and protects taxpayers' dollars. For over a year, small businesses have persevered through a once in a lifetime crisis. But today, thanks to our collective efforts, small firms have hope. Across the country, customers are returning and business conditions are normalizing thanks to vaccines and public health measures. Though the pandemic may be receding, we must continue to work as a committee to see small businesses to the end of the crisis and help facilitate a strong recovery. I now yield to the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for calling this important hearing. While I'm glad we'll be having a conversation with Small Business Administrator Guzman, I am deeply disappointed and concerned that Secretary Yellen is not with us today. Um, as, you, as you spoke, she's required to be here by law, and I won't state the law, but it's supposed to be at least 120 days after enactment of the law, she's supposed to be here at least twice a year. Um, this is not only, uh, this is very troubling. 
Uh, it's And it's a complete violation of the law. I, I appreciate your comments, Madam Chair. I'd like to work with you to make sure that the law is followed and then we schedule a time in the future for Secretary Yellen. To that end, I have a letter here that's been signed by uh, all the members of the Republicans on the committee, as well as a list of, of um, uh, events and, and, and the schedules of Ms. Yellen over the last two months that I'd like to enter to the record. I have a couple of things. Without I'm objection. Okay. Thank Without you, objection. And you know, it, the list of activities I, I have no problem with. I think that she's doing her job, probably doing it well, but there is a couple of events on here that are actually political activities. And again, I don't have a problem with her doing that, except that it shows that she's prioritizing political activities over her job, which is by law supposed to be in front of us. That can't happen. Um, the Paycheck Protection Program was established in a bipartisan manner to be administered by the SBA and the Department of Treasury. With reservation, Secretary Mnuchin testified before this committee last Congress. His testimony was critical as it helped members on both sides of the aisle explore questions from their constituents and assisted members with next steps for the COVID relief programs. It is a clear sign that this administration's Treasury Department, one of the biggest in the federal government, is ignoring uh, America's small businesses. Simply put, if the Treasury Secretary and Biden administration truly cared about the nation's small businesses and their employees, Secretary Yellen will be testifying today. Despite the Treasury Secretary not being with us, we have much to discuss. COVID-19 was devastating to our nation's small businesses, entrepreneurs, and startups. Without precedent, state and local shutdown orders forced small businesses to either operate under strictly under restricted capacity numbers or close their doors to the public altogether. Responding to the backbreaking impact on small businesses, Congress and the Trump administration quickly focused on assisting small business workers. According to SBA's Office of Advocacy, small business employees represented approximately half the nation's workforce. Importantly, one program that was front and center for struggling small business was a paycheck protection program, which, would, which private sector lenders delivered to small businesses many, many, many loans and all the dollars in those loans. PPP offered potentially forgivable loans in the dollars that were used and to, with, on payroll and a few other eligible expenses, and millions and millions of small businesses took advantage of the program and it is now concluding. The next phase of the program will focus strictly on the PPP forgiveness. Beyond PPP, Congress also activated the EIDL program. But unfortunately, this program, which is administered as a direct loan program through SBA, has been riddled with fraud. From SBA Inspector General report highlighting $78 billion in fraudulent activity to a report released three weeks ago, where the Inspector General found over 800,000 EIDL applications that were flagged for identity theft concerns. It is clear the program is not safeguarding American taxpayer dollars. Any amount of fraud is un absolutely unacceptable. However, this level of fraud shows the SBA is not suited to administer any direct lending program. On top of the fraud issues, the idle program is slow to reach small businesses in time of need. Historically, the SBA uh, turn time to small businesses has always been at a snail's pace. In stark contrast, the PPP, unlike the idle program, was set up to capitalize on the efficiencies of private sector lenders, not the SBA. In addition to the turn time, the PPP also protected taxpayer dollars more effectively compared to EIDL due to lenders having responsibility to know their customers and know how to underwrite loans. As we continue to explore the SBA programs, we must look to the private sector to find efficiencies and innovations. The SBA's ability to make direct loans to small businesses must be studied. In addition to making loans, the SBA has also inefficiently operated the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant Program for struggling venues, theaters, and other cultural entities. The night before the program launched, the SBA's Inspector General warned of a series of concerns or serious concerns about the oversight controls in place. Then a few hours after the opening, opening a portal, the SBA had to take it offline to troubleshoot. The program eventually relaunched, but has yet to disperse any funds to struggling venues, although this morning, Conveniently this morning, they announced that they are going to disperse some money very shortly. Amazing how that works. Um, while the SBA has been ignoring the venues program, it has been championing, been championed by the S, uh, the it has been championed by the SBA's restaurant the administration's restaurant vitalization fund program. The SBA has celebrated the priority period, which unfairly picks winners and losers. This administration even highlighted that the program is reaching potentially undocumented individuals and those with an unknown immigration status 
over hardworking citizens of the United States, and they're even being sued for this discriminatory practice today. Overall, it seems each day brings another complication for the SBA. I know Republican members have many of the same concerns that I do. However, the SBA's track record for answering our questions has been underwhelming and at times non-existent. Thus far, my colleagues and I have sent numerous letters to Administrator Guzman and received limited responses. I would like to insert every letter that has failed to receive a response in today's record, um, hearing record, Madam Chair. I'd like to insert some record, some letters. Without there. objection. Thank so you, Madam Chair. I'm hopeful this conversation will produce results because at the end of the day, small businesses drive our nation's economy. We must provide an environment for small businesses to operate independently as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, this administration is threatening the small business recovery with increased taxes and more regulatory burdens. We cannot allow these changes to occur. The health of our nation will depend on the health of small businesses. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Luke Meyer. The gentleman yields back. I would like to take a moment to explain how this hearing will proceed. You will have five minutes to provide a statement and each committee member will have five minutes for questions. Please ensure that your microphone is on, is on when you begin speaking and that you return to mute when finished. I would like to introduce the Honorable Isabella Casillas Guzman, who was sworn in as the 27th administrator of the SBA. She previously served as director of the California Office of Small Business Advocate in the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. From 2014 to 2017, Administrator Guzman served in leadership of the SBA as the agency's deputy chief of staff and senior advisor where she oversaw policy and new program implementation. She earned a Bachelor's of Science from the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business. Welcome, Administrator Guzman. Ms. Guzman, you are now recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairwoman Velasquez. Thank you so much, and Ranking Member Liz Meyer, as well as members of the committee. I really appreciate uh, the invitation and the opportunity to be here. Uh, to discuss SBA's programs in response to the COVID pandemic. When I appeared before you as a nominee, excuse me, when I when I have been meeting with you all uh, it, over the past uh, couple of months since I've been in office, I've, I've mentioned um, how this unprecedented crisis for our nation's 30 million small businesses and innovative startups have created a sense of urgency at the SBA to work harder, think more creatively, and build more collaboration to meet the desperate need presented by this moment. And in my first two and a half months as SBA administrator, I can tell you that my motivation to deliver for our entrepreneurs has only intensified. And I have to share how proud I am of my incredible mission-driven team at the SBA, who despite having had to scale at a high intensity the past year plus, remain incredibly committed to our nation's entrepreneurs. They have been working around the clock to deliver all the components of the American Rescue Plan's crucial relief programs to ensure our small businesses can survive this disaster and get on the path to recovery, growth, and resilience. We're making significant progress, particularly in our efforts to reach small businesses owned by women and people of color who, because of longstanding barriers to capital markets and networks, suffered disproportionately from this pandemic and by many accounts weren't able to access relief. We're seeing the impact. The latest economic reports show that small business jobs have begun to rebound and proprietors' income levels have begun to recover. And we're hearing from the small businesses we serve that both our traditional and our new relief programs have created vital lifelines. Earlier this month, we successfully launched the $28.6 billion restaurant revitalization fund. As of Monday, when the application portal closed, We've received more than 372,000 applications, representing over $76 billion in requested funds. And more than half of those applications came from food and beverage businesses owned by women, veterans, and people of color, who, as directed by Congress, received priority access to the program. And we're reaching the smallest of the small food and beverage businesses, with one third of the total funds set aside just for them including a specific set-aside I created for businesses with revenues of 50000 and under. 
I'm proud of how we've rolled out this program in under two months while focusing on my key priorities of meeting small businesses where they are and integrating a customer first, technology driven and equitable approach. We also launched the $16.2 billion Shuttered Venue Operators Grant Program. As of May 25th, the SVOG program has received more than 13,000 applications for approximately $11 billion in requested funds. We started awarding our SVOG funds this week, and we hope to continue to help our nation's venues hold on until they can bring back the performances and experiences that are lifeblood, that are the lifeblood of the American culture. Through our Paycheck Protection Program and Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, we've now gone beyond $1 trillion in relief. And so far in 2021, 95% of PPP loans have gone to small businesses with fewer than 20 employees. Our priority across all of our relief programs is to get funds into the hands of small businesses swiftly, efficiently, and equitably. At the same time, we're also committed to maintaining a high level of oversight to minimize fraud and abuse while elevating transparency and open communication. We have implemented controls and oversight to better achieve that balance and reverse some of the previous fraud challenges that initially plagued the PVP and IDLE programs. I was pleased to hear both GAO's Bill Shear and SBA's Inspector General Mike Ware say in a recent House committee hearing that transparency at the SBA has improved under my watch and that our relationship is off to a very good start. There's a lot of work to do, but we're working diligently to ensure this relief gets into the hands of the businesses for whom it was intended. Beyond our COVID relief program, we're also looking to the future and our nation's economic recovery with an eye toward equity. Small businesses are starting to reopen, but they're still reeling with major revenue losses and most expect recovery to take more than six months. This means that we will continue to see the need for capital, which is why the SBA is exploring all options to open up capital access, including direct lending. Additionally, we know that the best thing we can do for our small businesses is to help our nation recover from COVID and get our marketplaces and main streets back to normal with more than 61% of adult Americans who have taken at least one shot of the COVID vaccine, we're making progress. The SBA is doing its part by getting the word out about the American Rescue Plan tax credit available to small businesses that provide paid leave to employees receiving or recovering from a COVID vaccination. There is so much more work to do. As the voice for America's small businesses and innovative startups, I will be leveraging every tool at my disposal to bring businesses back create jobs, and build an equitable economy that works for everyone. I look forward to partnering with you all to give entrepreneurs the tools they need to start, sustain, and grow into the future. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Velasquez, Ranking Member Lutzmeyer, and members of the committee for the opportunity to appear before you today. Thank you, Ms. Guzman. I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, Ms. Guzman, Administrator, uh, we will hear a lot today about fraud, which has been a concern since the relief programs opened. Since you took over as administrator on March 17, how has the agency worked to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse in its pandemic response programs, both old and new, like restaurants and shorter venues? The administration has made it a priority to implement um, all of our relief programs uh, with integrity and transparency. And SBA has, has been implementing a holistic approach to fraud mitigation to ensure consistency across all of those programs. It is a high priority of, of mine as well. As I said, I want to get this, these funds into the hands of those businesses it was intended to serve. So my staff is, uh, is aware that I take this seriously in cooperation uh, with the GAO and IG has been of high importance for us to make sure that we're um, implementing best practices and, and doing the most that we can to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, I've directed my team to look at best-in-class practices, adopting technology where it works to ensure that we're aligned with best practices that the IG and GAO have recommended, and we have been implementing controls uh, and evaluating it. Thank you. So you are open to provide any information required by the IG, GAO, uh, providing data that they must, uh, must access in order to make an assessment as to uh, uh, the, if uh, the, the programs are working as they were intended. 
uh, by law. That's correct. So the Restaurant Revitalization Fund has a 21-day priority period for grants to women and veteran-owned businesses and socially or economically disadvantaged firms. How is this program helping to ensure the equitable distribution of pandemic relief? We've worked really hard to do extensive outreach across the board for restaurants, uh, reaching our smallest businesses as well as those priority groups across the board. Uh, you know, we've done we've reached over 100,000 people with multiple events, and so that reflects in the large number of applicants that we've seen come through the system. Uh, we believe that that uh, outreach, that connection to resources is most critical to make sure that businesses of all types can access this program. Um, in addition though, we tried to streamline, put ourselves in the customer's shoes uh, and adopt technology to make sure that this process was as simple as possible uh, for them to access. And, and we've seen those results uh, come, in, come to play because it's on average about 20 minutes to fill out the application. Uh, there's technology prompts throughout to help businesses and they've gotten the assistance with great customer service uh, in over 17 languages. So we've done, we've done a and lot. The, yes, I have uh, some other question and too many to ask. Uh, so please, in the first round of the PPP, uh, large companies took advantage of the emergency relief, squeezing out the little neighborhood restaurants and mom and pop shops. Could you discuss how the set asides for community lenders and small businesses in LMI areas ensure that the capital was made available to the smallest of the small businesses and truly underserved businesses. Now, based on the performance that we've seen with these community financial institutions, our, our CDFIs and CDCs and minority depository institutions, we know that they oftentimes reach those businesses that have been underserved. And so we've, uh, you know, those priorities have enabled businesses to access the program. And as I shared that we've seen uh, in 2021, that the PPP has been accessed more by LMI uh, communities as well as rural and uh, those underserved marketplaces. Thank you. The pandemic has exposed uh, the systemic inequalities facing women and minority-owned small businesses, which have been particularly hard hit uh, this past year. What steps are you taking to address these inequalities and make sure all small businesses have access to SBA resources? Uh, I have instructed my teams to really position themselves in the customer's um, mindset. I mean, understanding what their financials look like, what their situations look. Businesses have been transformed, especially during COVID. Uh, their situations are quite different. So we're evaluating all our programs to make sure that they can serve um, all constituencies equitably uh, and uh, everything's on the table. In addition, uh, we're focusing on the outreach and the Community Navigators pilot program will be just another tool that we can use to make sure that our businesses are connected to the resources that they need. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I, I really want to commend you for raising the limit on the idle loan program to 500,000 as one of your first uh, actions as administrator. So uh, I, my time has expired and now I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Rukemeyer, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and welcome, uh, Mr. De Guzman. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, as, as we as we all know, and we discussed here, you know, COVID hit our country and caused all sorts of unprecedented things within our economy to happen, uh, shut down the economy, and as a result, lots and lots of small businesses were in the dire straits. Uh, some of them uh, going out of business, some of them, you know, temporarily postponing their their ability to have their businesses open, and um, you know, the, we put in place the PPP program and the IDLE program. Uh, but they had dramatically different uh, outcomes. Uh, the PPP program, which was run by and administered by uh, the, 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 the financial institutions, uh, did a really, really good job. Uh, when you look at 800, over $800 billion going out the door and the, the minimal amount of fraud and theft, identity theft that went on, it's in the 10 thousandths of a percent, which in, by any measurement, that's, that's very successful. Idle program uh, program uh, to, to contrast that was over two hundred billion dollars, and roughly a third, according to the uh, S SBA's Inspector General, um, as I in my opening remarks, has either been uh, you know 
pointed out that there's potential fraud, if not documented fraud, uh, identity theft in particular with that program. Over 800,000 applications uh, have been flagged for identity theft. Uh, there's a difference in the way these two programs are administered. One is through the private sector, uh, which has laws and, and rules with regards to knowing your customers. Uh, they have processes, pre procedures in place. They know how to administer loans, make loans. Uh, and then the SBA was totally in charge of the EIDL program. Um, do you believe that the, or do you acknowledge that the private sector lenders from the community banks to the CDFIs and MDIs efficiently delivered funding to small business during COVID, uh, Minister Goodman? Our partners have done a great job um, as they have across our historic programs in implementing uh, the PPP. Yes, I would agree with that. And then in terms of the idle specifically, um, note that there were some challenges in the way the program was designed, which is why I've informed my staff that we need to look at fraud controls from inception of design and implementation. So for example, for idle by statute, we were not allowed to collect tax returns, which is one of the biggest controls um, that we can use as a tool. So, you know, without some of those controls in place in the beginning, um, of course, that has now shifted. And we have uh, in, in adopted controls in place to prevent fraud uh, in order to really uh, meet the needs of these small businesses and make sure it gets into the hands think, of the folks. Do you think, do you think uh, incorporating some private sector lenders in the middle of that would be helpful? I know that uh, um, across the board, our private sector lenders are great partners um, across the board, but um, in terms of the interest in providing disaster assistance historically, uh, you know, they have not been interested. It's, it's been too costly for them to adopt uh, this type of relief, and that's why the government has stepped in to provide. Well, maybe, maybe we can maybe we can work together, Administrator, to to iron out that little diff, that little problem there, in that uh, a third of the money could be susceptible to fraud is totally totally unacceptable. Something has got to change structurally within what's going on in the idle program. And it looks to me, if you just compare PPP to the EIDL program, the template's there for how to fix this. But uh, I want to work with you on that. We've got a huge problem. Together, we can come up with some solutions. Thank you. I look forward to that. The PPP program, um, I just want to talk about it for a little bit with regards to the forgiveness aspect of it. Um, you know, we, uh, we just got a letter back uh, from uh, Mr. Kelly uh, within your office there. And he was telling us that there's still roughly uh, a little over 36,000 PPP uh, loan forgiveness applications that have now a, exceeded the 90 day window of a, a requirement within which the, the, the uh, SBA should begin to um, or should administer this uh, forgiveness program. Uh, what, what's your solution on that? How can we get this fixed? Mm -hmm. For context, I mean, the SBA has processed over 60% of the 2020 uh, PPP loans for forgiveness. That 36,000 represents um, about 1% of the total, and we're committed uh, to trying to work through those uh, those issues with the lenders. Uh, the Capital Office of Capital Access obviously has been collaborating uh, with the lenders to try to figure out how we can um, help their review process. On average, it takes about six days for the SBA to process forgiveness once the lender has signed off. And so we are working in partnership with partnership with them to solve this issue. Is, it, is there is there ability to contract that out so we could speed that up? Because the next round of forgiveness is just around the corner here with this last uh, tranche of PPP money. Is there is there a way we can speed that up, make sure that this is done in a more timely fashion? Would contracting it out be helpful? Uh, I'm not sure that contracting out would be helpful, but we have been working with the, the lender groups. Uh, I've been meeting with them myself, as well as Patrick Kelly, to come up with solutions to try to streamline this system. Obviously, 150 can under have a simplified process. So those 150 to $2 million um, dollar loan sizes are obviously what we're looking at to try to streamline as the demand is going to increase as we shift to, towards forgiveness. So I look forward to partnering with you on that. Very good, because I know there's... we we. Uh appropriated lots and lots of money over the last two or three bills here to be able to do this. So we either need to be hiring more people or we need to be uh, contracting this out so this can get done in the, in the, the, the timely fashion and whether it's just supposed to. So we look forward to working with you on that, Administrator Guzman. Uh, with regards to communication, um, you know, we started out, um, I think, on the right foot. It took about a week to get our first call, call set up, but we finally got that done and we, we were able to respond pretty quickly to my first initial letter. But uh, yesterday, or, day, or I guess last week, we finally got a letter in response to something we did two months ago. 
Um, so it, it's, uh, and I know my colleagues are very concerned. You're going to get a lot of questions on this today about communication. Mr. Mr. Luckemeyer, yes, uh, the time has expired. Okay. And we have it. We will, we will uh, send this uh, question uh, in written form to the administrator. We thank you, Madam Chair, and yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Now we recognize the gentle lady, uh, Ms. Davis from Kansas, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman, uh, and thank you for holding this hearing. I also want to say thank you to uh, Administrator Guzman for joining us today. We know that even with the rising numbers of vaccines um, and vaccinations uh, getting into people's arms, that uh, it, even with the decreasing numbers of infections, that many small businesses are still feeling the impacts of this pandemic. And uh, there are still a lot of financial and logistical hurdles that face small businesses um, throughout the economic recovery and reentry. And I know that uh, Ms. Guzman and, and, and our committee and all my colleagues remain committed to supporting uh, our small business community through all of these challenges. Uh, I'm going to piggyback a little bit uh, on the, some of the comments that the ranking member uh, shared. You know, in, in February, I, I, my office raised concerns uh, with the SBA about the fraud and abuse and the PPP and IDLE programs. And, um, you know, it, 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 in part, it's because uh, a number of uh, Johnson County residents, uh, which is in the third district in Kansas, have been the victims of identity theft and uh, fraud that was uh, that took place in the IDLE program. And I've urged the SBA to focus on these uh, cases. And it sounds like you are uh, because they're not only a misuse of taxpayer funds, but also directly and personally impacting uh, the constituents in, in my community. And Ms. Ms. Guzman or Administrator Guzman, I should say, uh, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the, the work that uh, the SBA is doing to uh, eradicate the, the fraud the and, and waste and abuse from the IDLE program. And and then if you could also talk a bit about the ways that uh, the SBA is working with the victims of identity theft and fraud um, that that's taken place through either IDLE or PPP to just to ensure that those victims are not um, held uh, personally liable and, and that they're made whole. Yes, thank you for that. I mean, as I had shared that uh, we are implementing controls and evaluating on an ongoing basis. It's an iterative process um, to stay you know, best in class to prevent fraud. Um, and that, that happens at the program design phase and, and enterprise wide. Um, so we're really committed to this issue. Uh, we have um, obviously put in a lot of specific frameworks in place on both, uh, you know, our, across our capital access programs, including PPP and the restaurants program, and then within our Office of Disaster Assistance on the shuttered venues, as well as the IDLE program and targeted IDLE. We are really um, committed to making sure these funds get into the hands of, of those businesses that was intended, and we are seeing enormous drops now that we've implemented those controls. Um, however, in February, we did implement a process to help businesses through identity theft issues, as clearly that was a, a huge problem in the beginning um, of these programs. And so we want to um, make sure that businesses are supported through that process. There's now um, a support system and a process in place for them to reach out to the SBA and get assistance uh, in, in fighting that uh, specific identity theft case. And we actually have um, hundreds of investigators um, on place, uh, on support with the IG to um, help prevent, uh, help investigate and actually uh, pursue any cases of fraud as we take all cases very seriously. Thanks, I appreciate that. And um, if if necessary, you know, our, our office of course will will reach out if, if we're hearing things that, um, that that are, you know, continue to be of concern so that you're aware of it and are able to address it. Um, I, I appreciate that. And then the second thing I wanted to, you, start, you mentioned a little bit about the, um, about restaurants, you know, re restaurants, bars, the shuttered venues have obviously been hit especially uh, hard during this time, which is why Congress, uh, why we targeted resources toward those small businesses. Um, I know the demand for those funds are um, uh, over oversubscribed. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the expansion of eligibility or um, or allowing for additional funds to continue these programs. In your view, uh, does that make sense? And is it something that we should be working toward? 
we've we've seen a huge demand, as I said, um, over you know, 76 uh, you know, billion dollars in requests on the restaurant program, um, on the shuttered venues program. It's um, over 11 billion, but it looks like uh, I know applications are still coming in. Uh, we're still accepting applications, but we it looks like there might be enough funding for that in addition for them to get the supplemental. Uh, but on the restaurant finalization fund, we're happy to provide any data and support Congress as they make that decision uh, to you know, replenish that uh, that fund and, and support restaurants through this time. We are still seeing, uh, obviously, a huge demand, and this assistance is helping them keep their doors open. Thank you, Administrator, and I appreciate you being here and your testimony today, and uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentle lady yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Hagedon, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Velasquez, and I appreciate you bringing up the fact that uh, uh, Ms. Yellen was not here today, and you know, thank you for doing that on behalf of the committee. Uh, Administrator Guzman, uh, as, a, as a member on the Republican side of the aisle, I can assure you that uh, every colleague uh, that I that is on the committee that I've uh, served with in both last Congress and this has tried to, uh, in a bipartisan way, pass bills that are going to help all of the American people, particularly our small businesses in this instance, get from one side of the coronavirus to the other. And we did that in a number of ways with a bunch of different programs, but we wanted to treat everyone equally. And just last Thursday, I, along with my fellow Republicans, sent you a letter talking about the restaurant revitalization fund. And we don't really believe that everyone is being treated equally when it comes to that particular program. For whatever reason, the Biden administration, the Democrats put together a priority list, which prioritizes a lot of different restaurant owners and they're all great and we wanna help them all. Uh, but for whatever reason, the priority list, uh, the people who weren't on that list weren't allowed to uh, be funded at this time because you closed you closed the whole portal uh, the very day that the priority list was uh, set to end uh, sending in applications. For the record, can you explain to us the characteristics of the of the uh, people that are bar and restaurant owners who were not on the priority list? Sure, of course. And and you know the initial outreach that SBA did was extensive with the National Restaurant Association as well as the Independent Restaurant Coalition to reach all of the businesses. We informed everyone that this was. Uh, first come, first serve, and that everyone should apply, just despite what the uh, processing priority was going to be for those first 21 days. And I think that's reflected uh, in the 372,000 applications. Um, only 214,000 of those are for the underserved uh, or priority groups, um, you know, which includes, of course, veterans, women, and social and economic. Well, who, who is it? Who is it on the priority list? That was my question. Well, it in, the, the priority list includes women, veterans, and socially and economically who, disadvantaged individuals. Who, who is not on the priority list? Yeah, you know, those individuals that don't fill it, fall into those categories if they're not okay. socially or economically disadvantaged. Um, well, and it, it, all outlined. Um, I'll reclaim my time. It would be helpful if we just be honest about it. So anyway, the portal closes. The only people at that point who are going to be funded are people on the priority list. 100,000 or more bar and restaurant owners across the country that aren't part of the priority at this point won't be funded. They happen to be, uh, let's just be honest with it, white men that own bars and restaurants. Those are the folks. How is that not discriminatory or even outright racist? Well, you know, white men who uh, either have partners who fall into those categories, it's not 100% ownership, um, it's, you know, 51%. Uh, in addition, veterans um, uh, you know, are able to access this program. And what I would say is that the priority, while the application closed, we have all those applications and we're beginning to process all applications on priority as well. There were also small business set-asides. Uh, and so those, uh, you know, some of those small business set-asides remain. Uh, and so those will also, um, you know, businesses that fall into those categories will have an opportunity to be funded. But those are the only people that weren't part of the priority. So I doesn't, it makes sense to me that that would be discrimination in any sense. The other thing I'd, I'd add is that, uh, how can we uh, be sure that illegal aliens aren't receiving this money before US citizens? Uh, we know that um, a, you know, restaurants are job creators clearly and the M and uh, you know immigrant entrepreneurs just as much so, uh, they're all job creators, they're all tax paying. You have to be uh, based in the US tax paying uh, entity in order to access this program. And that's the threshold that we've followed. So there's no assurance of that. 
Look, I, I think it's bad enough that when the government, federal government picks winners and losers, that's the socialist policies. And uh, to do so based on race and even putting uh, illegal aliens ahead of U.S. taxpayers, to me, doesn't make any sense. We should all be treated equally. We should all have the same opportunity. And right now, it doesn't seem, it seems like there's a big segment of our population who happen to be bar and restaurant owners who are not being treated equally. And I, I hope that we would, would reject that type of racial politics. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and now we recognize uh, the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Phillips, for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome, Ms. Guzman. Uh, we're all of us are hearing about uh, the current programs, PPP, EIDL, uh, not meeting the needs of certain heavily impacted small business industries, um, fitness and, and wellness uh, being a good example. Has the SBA considered recommendations to this committee? on some alternative solutions, perhaps to buoy these uh, these small businesses? We do, uh, there, you know, we hope to continue to serve um, on, on PPP and fillets um, over these smallest of the small businesses and including those highly impacted industries referenced. Um, and so we do believe that there's um, opportunity to access that program as it was opened up more for sole proprietors and independent contractors uh, to change the way that we assess the, the dollar amounts of that program. So um, I do um, I do believe that's still an opportunity. In addition, of course, we have the targeted idle advanced program uh, that we have been pushing out. There are specific eligibility requirements um, across that program, but in early June, we will be opening up that program uh, more broadly to all those in the eligible categories outside of those who previously um, applied for idle advance. And so we think that's another opportunity uh, to support these underserved businesses, um, impacted industries that still need relief. Okay, and, and Ms. Guzman, any any potential to expand the SBOG program to include fitness operators? Uh, the the statute on the SBOG was very very specific uh, in many ways and very prescriptive about the eligibility requirements, and SBA is following um, that guidance from Congress. At this okay. time, there's no okay. no way to expand that. Okay, I uh, just want to make sure my advocacy is clear relative to certain industries that really have struggle disproportionately. Uh, my, my next question is about the restaurant revitalization program uh, and as it relates to closed locations and determining eligibility. Uh, despite the SBA indicating that closed business locations are ineligible, which is uh, I think on form 3172 item three, uh, some are being shut out from receiving the funding to keep the businesses afloat because the forms require them to count closed locations amongst their operating entities. So will the SBA provide any guidance and updates in its forms uh, that reflect that restaurant locations not doing business as of March 13th, 2020, and those permanently closed uh, won't prevent a group from qualifying for the RRF? I will go back with my uh, RRF team to explore that issue and get back to you. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, when the committee heard from the GAO and SBA Inspector General, we learned that while millions of Americans America's small businesses have benefited from the programs. Uh, SBA was repeatedly warned that the speed in which the programs were implemented left the agency with limited safeguards to identify and respond to risks such as improper payments and, and clearly fraud. Uh, I'm concerned about the potential for fraud in the restaurant program as well, as some of my colleagues have already indicated. Uh, with the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Oversight Investigations and Regulations, uh, the two of us have introduced legislation to require the SBA to report to Congress on the plan, their plan, your plan, and the steps that have been taken to ensure that the resources within the program reach the businesses in need. Uh, can you share with us, the entire committee, what steps, if any, that you've taken so far relative to oversight? On the restaurant revitalization fund specifically, we have um, implemented you know, best practice, industry best practices as well as um, strong controls, fraud controls in place. Um, to ensure that, uh, you know, ensure that there's limited fraud in the program. We've reviewed our full plan uh, with the IG and GAO and, uh, and feel comfortable with the, you know, with the current uh, process that we're following uh, to reduce that and minimize that risk uh, wherever possible. And it's an iterative process and we continue to, to look at the upgrades as we, as we move forward. Okay, well, we, if, if anything unifies Democrats and Republicans, in, in this case, it surely is relative to prevention of fraud and ensured dollars are being used appropriately, effectively, and efficiently. So we thank you uh, for your attention to that. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. 
The gentleman yields back, and now we recognize the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Stauber. Stauber. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and uh, uh, Administrator Guzman, I appreciate uh, you being here today. I am extremely frustrated with Secretary of Treasurer Yellen not following the law. As the chairwoman eloquently stated, it's her responsibility to follow the law and be here. And uh, I equate my frustrations with both the chairwoman and, uh, and ranking member uh, Luke Meyer for, uh, for the comments um, uh, against Yellen for not showing up. It is just unconscionable that she's not here blatantly not following the law, which says, I think, uh, a lot about uh, the individual. Uh, Secretary, uh, Administrator Guzman, how many small businesses are organized as a sub-chapter C corporation? I don't have those exact, exact numbers. Um, you know, it's, it's not as, uh, it's most, it's a, it represents more of the employers than small businesses as a whole. Can you give us a um, guess? Can you give us a guess? Um, I can't give you a guess. I apologize. I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. Of course, I've looked at it, um, you know, because obviously it's, it's not, uh, you know, there's some tax benefits we've looked at before and small businesses just do yeah. not, um, just do not be yeah. in that category. It's, Would you say hundreds of thousands? Oh, I'm sure. Um, okay. Has the Biden administration proposed increasing the corporate tax rate, thus increasing taxes on these 100,000 small businesses that are organized as a subchapter C corporation? You know, I know that um, small businesses across the board, uh, you know, have average average revenues that are that are very small. I mean, uh, if you look at the Office of Advocacy's report, the, yeah. those revenues are under fifty thousand um, yeah. you know, dollars. Administrator, 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 Gu administrator Guzman, because my time is limited. The question was: Has the Biden administration proposed increasing the corporate tax rate on these uh, subchapter C corporations? They, those should not, we are focused on trying to uh, remove some of those loopholes for the larger entities. Uh, we do not intend to affect the small entities. Um, is that a yes or a no? That's, you know, from my understanding, uh, you know, I, I, we are not focused on the small entities. We're focused on the larger corporations and the loopholes uh, that exist for some of those, those entity types. Administrator Guzman, how many small businesses are organized as pass-through businesses? Again, I don't have those numbers off the hand and I couldn't share those with you, but I'm happy to follow up with your staff and we can have a more... Uh, Administrator, Guz Administrator Guzman, there's approximately 95% of small businesses that are passed through. Has the Biden administration proposed rolling back the Section 199A deduction on these pass-through incomes? thus potentially increasing taxes on some 95% of small businesses that are organized as pass-through businesses? I'm not familiar with the specifics, so we will have to follow up, but I appreciate the question. And of course, you know, small businesses um, seek simplicity. Um, they are, you know, obviously, um, you know, it's critical that we are able to help them both on the revenue side of the equation as, as well as um, support them with, with a tax structure that doesn't favor large corporations. Will the Biden administration increase taxes on pass-through corporations? Again, I don't have those specifics. How will substantial increase in the capital gains tax and regulation help small businesses, quote, build back better? I appreciate the line of questioning around the, the tax issues for small businesses. Obviously, it's really critical that um, you know, our economists continue to look at ways that we can improve the economy and help those small businesses um, you know, across the board. Uh, again, uh, the focus is on trying to ensure that the uh, system is equitable for our small entities as well as large corporations and ensure that uh, the- Administrator, Administrator Guzman, in, in, in light of time, I just have 30 seconds. Sure. Uh, Will the increase in the capital gains tax help or hurt small businesses? It will depend on the on the um, size and, and scale of those investments. So I can't speak specifically. I don't have the analysis. 
So you can't answer the question whether tackle, ta capital gains will help or hurt small businesses? I don't have the full analysis, economic analysis on that. Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Um, this is the reason why we need Secretary Yellen here. Uh, SBA administrator is in charge of programs that have nothing to do with tax policies. Um, now we recognize Ms. Newman from Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Velasquez, and thank you, Ranking Member, for putting this together. Administrator Guzman, welcome. So uh, I, I'm just going to refer to my colleagues' um, comments just right before me. Um, by and large, when we've spoken to the Biden administration at length, they are making sure that small business is not affected by any tax increase of the largest of companies. And again, I stress that uh, the Biden administration has made, in fact, that's a, a line in the sand I would be willing to commit to um, from the Biden administration. So that for the record. And then secondly, um, capital gains has been studied time and time again. It, it never affects uh, small businesses the way my, my colleague is suggesting. So I encourage him to look that up. But my question for you, um, Administrator Guzman, is um, regards two things. Is that I know you have hit the ground running since March 17th. A lot, lot going on very obviously, but um, structurally, um, some of the things, you, the first thing you do when I've gone into an organization is to look at the structure of the organization. Have you made enhancements or improvements across your leadership? Um, and you don't have to get into hiring, firing, but are, have you reorganized in any way that will help address some of the issues that have been cited, right? Data integrity, um, there is a little bit of fraud out there um, and some of the other bigger issues. So if you can talk broadly about your structural uh, reorg. Well, the, the number one thing is that we continue to look at systems and process, and that includes the, the structure and how we um, and how our departments um, are, are, are functioning under the leadership. However, across the board, what we've tried to implement is an enterprise-wide approach, um, you know, breaking down some of those silos and, and increasing collaboration across the board. A great example uh, is in the IDLE and PPP program, uh, our Office of Capital Access and Office of Disaster Assistance are working more collaboratively now with the Office of Field Operations so that those boots on the ground of the SBA and district offices across the country are able to access information on those loans for our constituents and be able to help them through the process. Previously, that was shut down. And so we've re-implemented that as an example. So that cross-collaboration, the enterprise-wide approach uh, has definitely already been um, started and we'll continue to look at other improvements specifically within departments as we move forward. Thank you for that. Second question is with regard to Community Navigator. I thought this was a brilliant program. You know, about 80% of my GDP in Illinois 3 are uh, companies under 15 employees and under 2 million in net revenue. And therefore these folks, um, the owners, um, and they're largely family owned are working very hard every day on their business and don't have time to navigate um, onerous documents. Um, and so the Community Navigator Program, I think is brilliant, but I know that we're not quite there yet. Can you give us an update on when those navigators will be available and if you're going to use consultants and volunteers and the like? So if you can share. Yes, on the Community Navigator Pilot Program, the, the NOFO, the Notice of Funding Opportunity was released yesterday. Uh, we have a, a 45 day open period for the nonprofit, both national as well as local, regional, to apply uh, to either be a hub or a spoke uh, in the in the system. Obviously, the ultimate goal is to get hyper local with authentic uh, and uh, you know competent local organizations who can help businesses navigate the resources that are available to them and hopefully better access them uh, in the future. Great, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for being here, and I yield back. The gentle lady yields back, and now we recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And uh, uh, I'm a small business owner, have been for 51 years. I'm also the author of the Save Our Stages uh, bill that we've been talking about today. Uh, Madam Chairman, you're head of the Small Business Administration, correct? Can you hear me, Madam Chairman? Well, uh, are you speaking? Um, You're head of the SBA, right? Yes. I'm I'm okay. Of the SBA. All right. Mm -hmm. So my question is, have you ever met a payroll? Have you ever uh, started a small business? Have you ever drawn a line of credit? Have you ever sold a product? 
Yes, I have. I I was I come from a family of small business owners. And I okay, grew up and just it. and just to help you along the way, let me tell you, it's on well, these tax uses you're getting asked about. Just remember this: low taxes helps business, high taxes hurt business. Now, I sent you letters uh, on February fourth, February twenty fifth, March eighteenth, April 9th, April fifteenth, and April nineteenth to try to give my constituents an update on the Save Our Stages and the PPP program. And like we've heard today, to date, I have not received one response, even with the uh, chairwoman being on these uh, letters with us. So what you're doing, you're ignoring my request. You're blowing me off. You're blowing 700,000 people off in my district in Texas that sent me to Washington to help fix problems. So, Madam Administrator, when we spoke on the phone last month, you said that these communication problems would be fixed, and yet nothing has changed, not only for me, but for others. So how are you going to, what are you going to do to get these communication issues fixed? The, or, or should we just talk to lobbyists? I mean, we're hearing more from lobbyists than we are from, fr from your office. So should we talk to you or lobbyists? How are you going to get this fixed? And with a short answer, please. I remain committed to transparency and collaboration, and we've done over 100 briefings to date. We're providing weekly, monthly reports, um, okay. an increase in outreach to our but, oversight committee. But you have failed to call me back. Second question. Today marks 151 days since the Shuttered Venue Operator Grant Program was signed to law by President Trump. I am the author of that. We've seen countless music venues and movie theaters go out of business while the rest have been struggling to keep their doors open until this vital assistance hits their bank accounts. Uh, and as these businesses have been waiting while the Small Business Administration struggles to get the program off the ground, the agency turned all their focus to the Restaurant Revitalization Fund and got funds in bank accounts within seven days of the application opening to the date uh, that now has sent nearly $28.6 billion out the door well, the Save Our Stages program has delivered absolutely zero, nothing. So it's hard to classify the SBA's rollout of this program uh, uh, under your watch as anything but a total disaster and a total failure. So on behalf of 12,000 venues who've waited over five months, when will these businesses see the money? We understand today through the lobbyists, we've learned that. Uh, and... Uh, and, and, and is it a problem? Is, was this this way because this was a President Trump thing and you just pushed it to side like we saw so many with the Biden administration? So uh, why weren't why can't we get it right like we did with the restaurants? I appreciate that question. And I just to, to clarify, this shuttered venues operator grants program is being administered by a whole different team, our Office of Disaster mm -hmm. Assistance. We actually place the restaurant revitalization fund in a different office to ensure resources. Well, why don't you give it to that group and let both. them get it? Why uh, don't you let, what, Madam Chairman, why don't you give it to that group and let them get it out? Well, actually, this team has been working really diligently around the clock. They are capable and uh, being effective in terms of finally overcoming okay. some of the initial technical issues that we experienced okay. with the vendor. This program, obviously, we've had over 13,000 applications, and we're working through those as quickly as possible. Right. Uh, this was a much more complex program as written. Uh, some of those learnings, yes, were taken um, as the, R, the RRF was written so that we had some okay. simplification um, in the process I, by statute. I, I hear you. I've got another question, but it's going to be hard to tell those people that, okay? Now, thirdly, building off this last question, when we say that there's been zero money delivered to save our stages, that is just talking about the first priority group. There are two more groups that will likely be waiting until July to receive any money at the rate we're currently moving. So additionally, we saw the RRF that the money ran out the first priority group was after they were able to apply. So Administrator Guzman, can we expect to see the same numbers in the Save Our Stages program with a great deal of business businesses being left out of any assistance at all? as we did with the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, or should we just ask the lobbyists? We actually uh, have, you know, applicants from all of those priority groups. So the, you know, the 90% losses, um, we have about 4,000. We have, uh, you know, another couple thousand in the 70%, another 4,000 in the 25%. So we encourage everyone to apply. We don't anticipate well, that this money. They do apply, but they can't get the money. Correct. We're processing them as we go um, in those priority categories. Uh, however, you know, based on the demand so far that we've seen, yeah. um, we we do believe that we have enough funding. Well, you need more people than I guess that uh, to have get it done. Anyway, I think my time is up, Madam Chairman. I yield back. 
The gentleman yields back, and now we recognize the gentle lady from Georgia, Ms. Bordeaux. Thank you, Chairwoman Velasquez and uh, Ranking Member Luca Meyer, and thank you, Administrator Guzman, for joining us today and for reaching out to the uh, many small businesses in, in my district uh, and holding a, a forum here to help them uh, as you rolled out the restaurant um, revitalization program. Um, the Paycheck Protection Program, as you know, has provided millions of small businesses with a lifeline to keep their doors open and employees on the payroll over the past 14 months. Um, but now that the PPP funds are virtually exhausted, uh, we're hearing from more and more small business owners uh, who will be seeking loan forgiveness in the coming months. Nearly 2 million 2020 PPP loan recipients have yet to apply for forgiveness. And uh, I know that they're anxious uh, to better understand how they can obtain this. So I was just wondering how the SBA is working with lenders to re-engage borrowers and ensure that they understand how to apply for loan forgiveness and have you observed a difference in the speed or manner in which the large versus small PPP lenders uh, have processed their borrowers' forgiveness applications? Uh, we are working closely with the lenders to just make sure that we have the systems in place to support uh, the, the forgiveness applications that will be coming in. Um, in addition, we're looking to uh, be creative about how we can uh, find innovative ways to streamline that process as we move forward into forgiveness especially for, as I mentioned previously, the 150000 uh, to $2 million range um, that doesn't have the expedited process. And so uh, we do we do expect, uh, and what we've seen in the past is that it's all different sizes um, of, of forgiveness loans of the 60% that we've processed so far from 2020 loans. Uh, and so we haven't seen any specific trends. I think just overall, uh, folks are looking for simplicity, looking for assistance, and we hope to continue to try to provide the outreach necessary to support them. Okay, well, thank you. Um, one other uh, question here, IDLE, about the IDLE program. Um, it's provided over 200 billion in relief to small businesses since last March. Um, but less than 10 billion in new loans have been approved since February. And you mentioned in your testimony that the Small Business Administration still has about 263 billion in loan program authority remaining. Um, do you have information on the amount of unspent funds appropriated for the COVID-19 idle subsidies? Yes, and, and what we're doing on idle is the continue, obviously I made that initial change, uh, increasing the limit from 150,000 to 500,000. Uh, we saw 1.5 billion in demand come through uh, from just that uh, change alone. And as I committed, we would be we will be increasing that to 2 million, which is the uh, true authority of the idle program, uh, so that we can uh, you know continue to support businesses that need that assistance. There is uh, 263 billion in authority left. Uh, and we will be focused on making sure that those businesses who are interested in it uh, can access the program. Just to follow up, the $263 billion in loan authority represents how much in the funds appropriated that are used to support that $263 billion. How much remains of the funds appropriated in that program? I'll have to follow up with you and get that specific. Okay, we appreciate that. Um, and if the maximum loan amount is increased to two million, as you mentioned in your testimony, um, how much of those funds do you anticipate will be used? We are not sure yet of that demand as we roll out that program uh, by July. We're hoping to finalize the technology to accommodate for those increases. Uh, we'll start to get a better sense of those numbers and can share that with the committee at that time. Okay, thank you so much. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentle lady yields back, and now we recognize uh, the gentleman from um, Pennsylvania, Mr. Muser, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman, and thank you, Administrator, for being with us, and uh, and certainly thanks to our ranking member, Luke Meyer. Um, so the PPP loans were quite successful. They they weren't perfect. They were a lifeline. Uh, we did a lot. It was a very um, holistic approach to assuring that they were efficient, valid, purposeful uh, as, as possible. Uh, that uh, Secretary Mnuchin and many members and banks and small businesses, it was very inclusionary on how to get it right. Um, it still is very important, of course, and I am hearing from many uh, businesses as well as banks 
that there are problems with the forgiveness initiatives, primarily related to loans between 150,000 and 2 million and the loan forgiveness over 2 million, I'm not sure any have been forgiven as of yet. Now we all understand that there's going to be a uh, uh, audit of the loans over $2 million, but administrator, is there a plan? Because currently it is a problem for banks and businesses. We're not seeing a, uh, a, pro a real process for forgiveness of these loans in these categories. Do you, or can you comment on that please? For the over $2 million, um, $2 million loan categories, yes, there is a you know, specific process um, that it's an individual review. Um, obviously, those were you know, flagged for SBA loan review due to the amount. Uh, and uh, you know, there is a process that SBA is following to uh, review those uh, even with bank partnership. And so um, you know, I know that those, obviously, this is a huge task that the SBA is taking on. Um, and will increasingly be so as those payments come due. Um, so we're hoping to try to you know, come up with a streamlined process as well for those 150 uh, to 2 million uh, bucket as well, as you mentioned, uh, to make sure that those can be processed efficiently and give us the time and the and resources to be able to address those individual reviews of the 2 million plus. Sure, thank you. Is it a priority and will we see some sort of plan that will be put into effect? Yes, it's this. a priority. We are working on that currently. Uh, and okay. so hopefully okay. we can follow up soon with some specifics. Great. Uh, Administrator, uh, Representative Stauber brought up the 20% uh, business income deduction that occurred in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Many small businesses are concerned about the Biden administration's plans for tax increases. Can you uh, tell us what you think about the 20% removal for, from small businesses? And are you weighing in with the Biden administration on behalf of the small business, the uh, millions of small businesses in our country uh, to uh, assure or do what you can to keep that deduction in place? Because that deduction, I think you know, was not a, a gift to the wealthy. Uh, it helped small businesses expand, get stronger and hire more employees as we saw with a 3.5% unemployment rate. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on the 20%? Yeah, I mean, I closely collaborate with the Office of Advocacy as well, um, you know, that has the uh, economists that can do the research as well. Clearly, I'm not a tax expert. Um, that's not my forte. I'm administering these programs on behalf of the Small Business Administration for relief for small businesses. So I continue to try to track those issues and uh, report up our findings uh, you know, to the necessary channel. Yeah. It's a major uh, interest and a factor for small businesses, growth, survival, and 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 just um, maintaining and working through the recovery. So, I I, I think the uh, SBA administrator should be very much an advocate for the health of of small business, as well. You know, it came up before about capital gains and. That's very important. Uh, the idea that the Biden administration wants to raise capital gains from 20% to 43% does have a great effect. If a bit small business is looking for a partner and or thinking about selling and retiring and passing the business along, that transfer has to take place. That's going to cost them 23%, which is $23,000 per $100,000. So it's not a trivial thing. It's very important. Uh, the other thing I want to bring up, please, is the uh, unemployment compensation. 90% of my small businesses in my district are, are literally diametrically opposed to the President Biden's comment that the additional supplement of unemployment compensation, as the President said, is not measurable for the level of workforce availability. And I will tell you this, I do weekly business calls with dozens of small businesses and virtually 100% say it's the number one issue, if not the number two issue of, of, of uh, uh, that they face, a headwind that they face. Can you comment on that? Do you, do you believe that where some of this is being targeted in some states and you know it, it is going to, by law, continue the supplement through August? Uh, again, as an advocate for small businesses, I, I would hope you would recognize that, be inclusionary, talk to the small businesses and get directly from them what their concerns are and, and work on their behalf. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. 
And uh, now we recognize the gentleman from uh, the newest member in the committee, uh, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Carter. Welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for your very <clears throat> warm and gracious welcome. I am uh, honored to be a part of this Congress, honored to be a part of this committee. Uh, Ranking Member Luke Meyer, um, good morning or good afternoon, I should say. Well, I guess it's still morning. Uh, thank you all very much. And Administrator Guzman, I'd like to personally thank you. I know your job has been difficult. I feel the frustration of all of the members here. I share their frustration, but I also recognize that uh, you have a very difficult task. Uh, this, there's nothing in the playbook to address a worldwide pandemic. Uh, the pain that it has caused for many of the people throughout our country, uh, certainly in the second congressional district, we are no different. Um, so I, I applaud your efforts. I, I feel the frustration of my, uh, my colleagues who, who express concerns about the availability of funds, the rapid nature of getting those funds and uh, the frustration that we hear from our business people. So um, at the risk of being redundant, I'll try to not repeat questions that have been asked, but I will uh, share that as, as you know, I represent the second congressional district, which is Louisiana. Uh, home of the, the historic French Quarter and uh, our beautiful river parishes uh, up and down the river from West Jefferson to West Baton Rouge Parish. Um, one of the issues that I repeatedly hear from small businesses is the ability to access PPP uh, as rapidly as some of the larger companies that have access to lawyers and consultants and accountants. Um, what plans, if any, do we have to address perhaps in the next round of, of resources to assist small businesses who oftentimes um, miss out because they don't have access to uh, the resources of accountants and, and consultants to prepare paperwork. Yes, and, and you know, obviously once the Community Navigators pilot program is launched and those um, organizations are brought on board to fully help the SBA and, and communicating resources and supporting businesses through process of relief, um, that will obviously make a big difference. But I will submit that on the Restaurant Revitalization Fund program, uh, we were able to effectively through partnerships reach to all different size businesses as well as from different communities and regions across the country. Uh, and so really uh, that's reflected in the applications, uh, the interest, the access, and I think what also was attractive was that we created a simple process, uh, you know, get leveraging technology, uh, using partners such as Square and Toast and other point of sale vendors uh, to help us access those restaurants who are underserved uh, so that they can uh, you know, connect to the platform and, and uh, apply for the program. So I think that there are some learnings in our restaurant revitalization fund in terms of how we do our outreach, um, how we're structuring our programs so that they are more customer friendly so that businesses of all sizes uh, can access the program easily. And we'll be applying those types of learnings across our programs as we move forward. And Madam Administrator, I have some thoughts that I'd like to share with you and my staff will be preparing some documents to share with you some thoughts that I think may assist with kind of segregating those funds and make it easier for small businesses to access them. One final question as my time um, runs out. Um, as you know, in Louisiana, we're just about 15 years past Katrina, uh, one of the largest uh, hurricanes and issues ever hit, uh, natural disasters that ever hit uh, Louisiana for certain. Um, any of our small businesses are still suffering and still paying back uh, SBA loans from that situation and have since had other situations of similar magnitude like COVID. Um, what relief, if any, can we look forward to in the way of forgiveness of some of those Katrina related SBA loans? You know, we did provide debt relief on all our programs. We've extended uh, payments on any um, idle loans to 2022, but um, in terms of any forgiveness, uh, you know, that would, I'd be, we'd be happy to collaborate with you, work with you to provide you any information that you need about our programs. Um, and we will implement any programs at Congress uh, directs to us. Very good. And, and, and finally, I'd like to once again uh, thank Representative and Chairman Velasquez for, for governing this meeting uh, as, as smoothly as, as you have. And thank you, Administrator Guzman, for making yourself available. I yield back my time. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman.
the gentleman yields back. And now we recognize uh, the gentle lady from New York, uh, Ms. Channing. Thank you, Chairwoman Velazquez and Ranking Member Lukemeyer for holding this meeting. And I want to say thank you to uh, Administrator Guzman for being here. We know that working in SBA is not an easy job right now, especially uh, in light of the pandemic. Um, I have a couple of, and I, I might add, uh, thank you for being here. Very disappointed that um, Secretary Yellen hasn't make an, made the effort to be here. Uh, she did speak before financial services in the past and really needs to fulfill her legal obligation to be here. So hopefully we'll be hearing from her soon. And I'm sure Chairwoman Velasquez and uh, Ranking Member Luke Amaro will make sure that happens. Uh, but I wanted to just address the administrator. There's, this is an issue that is really big in my region. Uh, actually, it's across the country. I am a small business owner. Our family business uh, is celebrating our 75th year here. Uh, we almost didn't think we were going to make it because of the pandemic last year. So many of the programs put out by SBA and the CARES Act have been vitally important to us. Uh, but one of the big issues now uh, facing every employer, everywhere I go, every business forum, every it's, it's the number one issue is the enhanced unemployment insurance benefits extending through August and how that is putting a huge impact on their ability to attract and to get people to work. And some in some cases, their own employees back to work because the benefits are so strong. What is your opinion on that? And do you think that we could in some way target that relief instead of uh, having this blanket coverage where you know we, we are hurting even seasonal employees, uh, seasonal businesses, agro-businesses in my community. You know, ag is number one in my region. Um, how do you think that, what, what do you think we can do to try to minimize that impact on small business owners? From what I've heard from small businesses, it's a combination of factors and, and definitely um, across the board, small businesses want help in, in, in making sure that their workers feel safe as well to come back to work. And so that's why we've been emphasizing heavily uh, the vaccination rates and by emphasizing the American Rescue Plan taxpayer, um, tax credit rather for small businesses who give time off to their employees to get that shot as well as recover from it. Uh, because we know that you know feeling safe in the in the in the workplace is also a big factor. Um, and also just the vaccination rates would help with the care economy and with schools uh, you know being reopened fully for, for the children to go back to work. Because I'm also hearing that that's a huge factor for a lot of the employees of these businesses is that they you know not only potentially fear of, of COVID in the workplace, but as well um, that that problem with having no care for children at home. And so I do believe that uh, the Biden administration's focus on fighting COVID is, is going to go a long way um, towards helping our small businesses access workforce. Um, and uh, then, can I just know, reclaim my time for a second? I'm not hearing that from small businesses. We have a fairly decent uh, vaccination rate here, very low contraction rate, a low death rate in rural areas here. So my concern is that what, what you know, many businesses invest either shut down entirely or invested, you know, a small fortune, which is a lot for businesses, you know, tens of thousands of dollars into plexiglass, PPE, and other items to make it safe for employees to go back to work. You know, we're not talking about our police officers, our firemen, our essential workers, and all the other essential, so-called essential. I think every worker is essential, but people who went back to work and are back work, we have to get our economy going. I'm just concerned that if we don't have a more targeted approach, we're going to see a collapse in our economy and we're, and we're going to have a problem getting them back to work. Don't you think that that should be an issue that the Biden administration be, so should be addressing you as, an, as the key administrator when it deals with small business? I mean, look at NFIB has said that uh, um, almost 50 percent of businesses are specifically citing the enhanced unemployment as the reason that people are not coming back to work because they can wait it out until August. And we know that's Partly true. I know a lot of people are working, even though they might even be making less. Don't you think that's something the Biden administration should be doing to get our economy going again? I know that we're looking at all the tools and obviously that support in the economy, those additional funds have also propelled our economy and, and supported business revenue creation at the same time. So, um, you know, it's not uh, my position at the SBA to judge in terms of the best economic decisions uh, to make overall for the economy. But I know that that has been a shot in the arm in the economy to have that stimulus check uh, distributed. Right, but we're, the we're running out of stimulus checks. Just one more thing is you said you're a small business owner. I mean, a lot of businesses are C-Corps. You know, our business has been around a long time. We're small. 
we're a C Corp, we're hurt by taxes. I think if you're a business owner, I think you can safely say that taxes hurt all businesses, large and small, but are particularly harmful to small businesses. And in an area like mine, 94% of the jobs created in my region are from small businesses. So we don't deal with the large business problem. So this, these, these taxes are gonna really hurt our community. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, this is really President Biden's uh, focus on taxpayers over um, earning, you know, over 400000 is really the, the priority focus, in, including the S corporation taxpayers. But, you know, all of the exceptions that are that are typically you know, benefiting small businesses, the rent capital gains, passive income will continue to apply. Um, and so the, you know, the budget includes provisions really to close those loopholes I referenced that allow, um, you know, larger corporate taxpayers with income over 400000 um, from avoiding paying certain taxes. And so that's really the, the focus, um, as I referenced earlier. So I, I you know, I appreciate um, the, what you're hearing from the constituents. I hear a combination of, of, of course, that plus um, the COVID issues and the care economy issues in education. So I, you know, look forward to continuing to partner with you to help support mm -hmm. our small business. They look for thank you. I, I think thank my you. time's up, but uh, thank you so much. And uh, I appreciate your testimony and for actually being here today. Thank you. Uh, the gentle lady's time has expired, and now we recognize the gentle lady from California, Ms. Chu. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Administrator Guzman, since the start of the pandemic, I've been extremely concerned about the Trump administration's failure to collect demographic data on PPP recipients. It prevented us from understanding which types of businesses benefited from the program at a time when so many were struggling. And that is why it was so significant that the Los Angeles Times had a recent investigation uh, in which they reported an alarming finding that in LA, uh, businesses in majority white neighborhoods in the early days of the PPP loans received loans at twice the rate of majority Latino areas, 1.5 times the rate of majority black areas and 1.2 times the rate in Asian areas. So clearly there needs to be more help for underserved businesses. And one of the most important lessons of this past year is that community financial institutions can effectively reach businesses that are not served by traditional banks and they can do so at scale. Now I've long championed the Community Advantage Program, which uh, leverages uh, nonprofit mission oriented lenders and have authored legislation to give the program long-term stability by authorizing it for five years. So how can we expand the role of CFIs such as Community Advantage in the small business lending ecosystem so that we can support an equitable long-term recovery? Well, one of the silver linings of the pandemic has been SBA's increased network of lenders that have been accessing the PPP program. And we hope to continue to partner with them, uh, including those mission lenders, um, CDFIs and CDCs and others, um, to make sure that we're supporting small businesses that are underserved because the data is stark in terms of access to these programs. Um, and the you know, U.S. Chamber had a similar study um, which showed that uh, black businesses um, were unable to access capital at the same rate, half the rate actually um, of white businesses. And so um, you continue to see that in the data. And so the SBA is working hard to try to find solutions um, to partner with uh, institutions that are serving these constituents as well as our, all of our traditional banking partners to better support through SBA programs, um, capital capital access uh, for these constituents. Thank you for that. Uh, Administrator Guzman, I wanted to ask about another issue, which is the Shattered Venue Grant Operator Program. Um, I'm proud to represent Southern California and the countless live venues such as the Troubadour and the movie theaters that make our region so special. Uh, they were the first businesses to close and will be the last to reopen. And that is why the Shuttered Venue program includes this supplemental phase for businesses still experiencing deep losses in the first quarter of 2021, like so many of the live venues in LA County. But because of the program delays, SBA uh, already actually has the necessary data from the applicants to calculate both the initial loans and the supplemental loans right now. 
So given the delayed implementation of this program, can you discuss if SBA can help these businesses by automatically calculating and processing the supplemental grant awards to expedite dispersal of these funds? And are there tools that Congress can provide to help you do this? Um, yeah, I, I mentioned before that the Shadow Venues Operator Grant Program was a, a complex statute that we were implementing and, and the program design dictated by statute, um, you know, obviously had lots of controls for eligibility requirements. There were so many different types of entities uh, that were eligible with very unique requirements under each. And we've worked very closely with our um, vendor and, and uh, you know, cross agency to make sure that we were leveraging technology to the fullest and um, simplifying processes. And we're continually uh, working through some of those issues to see how we can expedite as we go through uh, in processing, um, you know, taxes and, and other issues. And so. Um, you know, while there's, um, you know, while the program has been delayed, uh, you know, I feel confident that we'll continue to start to roll out these funds um, as we have been doing uh, this week. Uh, and, uh, you know, we appreciate the, you know, the, the patients from the industry. Obviously, they don't have time to wait. They, you know, the rent is due and um, other expenses are, are, are critical for them. So we are working uh, and take this program very seriously. Uh, and implementing it as quickly as possible. Uh, and so we'll, we'll, we we look forward to any further input that you have specifically with you know, certain venues and how we can improve the experience. Thank you. I yield back. Lady yields back. And now we recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Garbarino. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman. And uh, thank you to the ranking member for doing this and administrator. Uh, we appreciate you being here. I want to echo my colleague's uh, disappointment in Secretary Yellen's uh, absence today. Um, but I have a question. I've, I've been in Congress. I'm a new member for only a little under five months now. And you know, prior to being in Congress, I, with my law practice and being in the State Assembly in New York, I dealt with SBA, the local offices, and they were very good in you know, answering questions when I dealt with them. But my time now, and I've heard this from other members as well, a lot of questions to your office has have gone unanswered um, or been very delayed if they get an answer. Uh, can you explain what's behind this underwhelming response? And if we can't receive a response directly from you and your team, what recommendation, recommendations do you have for us to get uh, answers to the questions that we have? Um, it seems like the communication right now between the SBA and members of Congress uh, is very bad. Um, you know, we would like to have something done in a timely manner. How can you help us with this? Yes, and SBA is working to increase communication. It has increased dramatically um, in the Biden and Harris administration. And so um, just to you know, confirm, as I've said, we've had hundreds of briefings. We send out regular reports. Um, and we continue to try to respond to all of these letters as quickly as possible. Um, understanding, of course, that these requests um, you know, require uh, you know, career staff time as well as, uh, you know, just uh, uh, you know, sometimes days to pull these reports, uh, and that's disruptive to the process. Obviously, we're highly impacted by the scale that we've had to, um, to reach in order to serve small businesses, which remains a priority, uh, and we will continue to try to uh, get through all of your requests as quickly have, as possible. So we appreciate your patience. I understand that, and, and, and I know you're trying to contact, uh, talk with small businesses, but a lot of small businesses contact us when they have problems with the SBA, so we send questions over. I, we, I spoke to the previous administrator, uh, Ms. McMahon, uh, and she, she told some of us that she prioritized responses to member of, members of Congress where they she got back to them within a, uh, several days. Um, is that something that we can count on your office for, that when a request comes in, when a question comes in from a member of Congress, that we can we can expect a response from your office within a matter of days. Yes, and 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 unfortunately, during disaster, it's a little bit of a different situation because we're so impacted by all these programs. Um, unlike uh, under Administrator McMahon, however, um, you know, yes, it is a priority. My team knows it's a priority. I think we had COVID all last year. <laughs> we've um, what we've tried to do. Um, uh, what we've tried to do in the programs is, as I mentioned before, is open up access to some of those portals to our field operations as well. So I'm hoping that as, and you're also in touch with our local field office uh, as they can also help navigate some of these specific issues. But yes, constituent requests, those customer requests, we're trying to open up um, and access more of our team members to be able to answer questions like this 
And so, yes, we will continue to try to work with you to speed that up. Um, I, I do want to make sure that we'll reach out to you and make sure your staff is in contact with our field office who has this expanded now um, access into um, our portals to be able to uh, you know, understand where loans are in the process. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, and I have another question. Um, you know, dealing back with the idle program and fraud, uh, the fraud's uh, extremely concerning, the amount of fraud. Uh, we know that the SBA's uh, shuttered venues uh, grant program was flagged by serious problems in the beginning. Uh, it seems that new reports come out monthly on these programs. Uh, in your response to, to these reports, we know the SBA plans to inquire and implement many of the recommendations that it gets from the SBA Inspector General, that it gets from the Government Accountability Office regarding these relief programs. Out of these recommendations that, that you've received from the SBA Inspector General and the Government uh, Accountability Office. How many recommendations have you gotten and how many have you closed out, which means how, how many have you implemented out of those uh, recommendations? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the requests too and a lot of the reports that we're seeing now are unfortunately assessing the portfolio pre um, in 2020. And so a lot of the controls were put in place post um, in 2021. And so unfortunately that's not reflected in a lot of the um, current reports, but we are um, working to close out as many of the you know, IG and GAO reports as possible um, across the board. Um, and my teams are in conference currently. Uh, with how the, many, with I'm just, I only have a few times. How many have you closed out your team to date? Uh, I, I believe you've had 32 recommendations, but how many have you closed to date? How many are open? We'll, we'll follow up with you to give you that exact number. All right, thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Now we recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans, for five minutes. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Madam Administrator, uh, many small businesses in my district, especially minority uh, uh, businesses, are in desperate need of technical assistance. In your testimony, you mentioned that um, the American Jobs Plan will provide SBA the ability to create a national network of small, of small uh, business innovators and innovative hubs and technical assistance partners to ensure women and veterans and rural businesses uh, basically receive the support they need. Could you, uh, could you please elaborate on this proposal and how it will work? And work in the current uh, current resources. Yeah, obviously the SB has resource partners, our small business development centers, our women's business centers, um, who have uh, expanded recently, uh, including through HBCUs uh, as well as SCORE. <clears throat> and so, you know, with those resource partners, they play a critical role in helping us reach small businesses. Uh, but with the Community Navigator pilot program, we're going to be able to partner more extensively. Uh, resource partners are eligible to apply to that as well, of course. But the point of that is to create a hub and spoke model where there's a, a central source of information and uh, a network of more local navigators who can help small businesses connect to resources and help them understand the process, the application process, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, you know, with that program, we hope to fund national as well as you know, regional and local organizations to create that system of dispersing information about these programs as quickly as possible so that, you know, businesses that have traditionally been underserved would be able to access uh, those release programs. So how would you say you think it's proceeding at this point? Um, we've been, uh, we just released the notice of funding opportunity yesterday. And so we know that uh, we've done extensive outreach with organizations across the country uh, to make sure that they were ready to apply, um, you know, through the grant portal process and, uh, and hopefully serve our small businesses. Uh, through the system, and that includes, you know, diverse organizations and um, organizations across our region that are underserved. Madam Minister, I thank you for your leadership and your organization, what they're doing. And I think the technical assistance is probably utmost importance. Obviously, resources are important, but the technical assistance, I, I believe, is very important as a priority. Again, I thank you for your leadership. I yield back, uh, Madam Chair. The gentleman yields back, and now we recognize uh, Ms. Kim from California for five minutes. 
Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, I want to thank Administrator Guzman for joining us virtually, though I must uh, say that I share chair and ranking member and my colleagues' frustration. And I'm also disappointed Secretary Yellen is not testifying today to discuss how Treasury is assessing the impact on a possible increase in taxes on small businesses. You know, as one of the members of Congress who helped craft the Bipartisan PPP Extension Act, I wanted to follow up on some of the recent funding numbers that the SBA has been reporting and the decision to close the border. The, uh, let's acknowledge that the PPP application window will remain open for CFI lenders. So what specific steps did you take to alert all other lenders that the portal was going to close a few weeks back? And did you provide advance notice to the lenders? If so, how many days or weeks in advance did you provide? We continue to communicate with the lenders through our portal. Um, that's their, uh, how we communicate with them regularly in terms of where we're at in the system. Um, obviously, all the lenders have been tracking closely. Um, you know, the, the funding <clears throat> remain, uh, the remaining funds as we've been walking through this program and reaching the end. Um, so I you know, don't believe it uh, should have come to as a complete surprise to many, and we um, you know, informed them in advance that we were. Right. Let me uh, reclaim my time uh, as a follow-up then. What should lenders do if they have an application with an unknown status? If there are any lenders with hold codes in the system, we're working through those still. Those funds remain for those lending institutions, um, and their ability to process them remains open. Um, and they have not been shut out from the system. Uh, if it's for new loans, obviously they can work through CFIs, uh, whether it's you know, MDIs or CDCs or CDFIs to partner and make sure that those new applicants get through. Thank you. The PPP Extension Act also extended application deadline to the end of this month, but it also gave SBA extra 30 days to work through all error code issues for loans currently in the pipeline. So can you please provide us with a detailed response on how you envision the SBA using this 30-day period after the application window closes? So will all eligible applications that clear their error codes be able to proceed? Our goal is to work with all the lending institutions that still intend to move forward on any of their, hold, their held um, applications uh, to get them to completion. And so those extra 30 days will be helpful. Um, there is a process in place for SBA to coordinate with the lenders to make sure that um, any information is cleared um, and that the borrower is informed through the lender uh, of any requests for further information to release any of these holds. Okay, thank you. Well, you know, next question. Um, how are the SBA's entrepreneur development programs like uh, SBDC, WBC, VBOC score administered to avoid duplication and prevent fraud? Uh, across all of our grant programs, obviously we take fraud uh, you know, seriously as well. Um, you know, our, our, um, our score partners, as well as our SBDCs, WBCs, uh, have very strict, and VBOX have very strict reporting requirements uh, to the agency, and uh, we follow through you know, with audits across the board as well. Okay, well, well, let me, let me ask <clears throat> one last question here. Um, are there any current efforts to consolidate programs and resources to make it easier for small businesses to uh, access resources in a one-stop shop? Uh, additionally, what efforts are you taking to combat fraud and protect taxpayer dollars? Mm -hmm. Across our resource partners, obviously, they're all engaged in local ecosystem building to try to support, along with our field offices, um, small businesses and the support that they need. Uh, and so, you know, we believe that uh, you know, the cooperative um, you know, approach is most, um, in, in most valuable to us. And so we make sure that um, all of our departments are collaborating with these resource partners uh, and, and have open communication to make sure that they're positioned well to support small businesses. Um, and our field offices are really critical in bringing them all together. And that will apply towards the Community Navigator Pilot Program as well. Um, we see that the, uh, these, all these resource partners have been inundated during COVID and have, uh, have been contacted by many new businesses for support. And we hope that that engagement will continue as we move forward. Um, in terms of you know, fraud controls, 
um, or you know, prevention of any misuse of those programs. Again, our grants programs management uh, is positioned with processes to make sure that uh, funds are used and, and how we intended them to be used to support small businesses with technical assistance. Oh, thank you. I I see that my time's up. I yield back. Thank um, you. Has expired, and now we recognize the gentle lady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Coolahan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here. Uh, my, I have a several questions, and my first one has to do with uh, PPP loans and uh, the forgiveness process. Through a bill that I introduced and that was signed into law as part of the economic aid uh, this past December, SBA is now able to provide small businesses that received a loan of 150000 or less with the streamlined forgiveness process using the 35008S uh, forgiveness form. Uh, this was really a welcome change for small businesses and lenders to, to be able to streamline the forgiveness process and to make it easier for our smallest businesses to get that relief. However, based on data that was released by the SBA, there still are a substantial number of borrowers who have not yet submitted nor have been approved for forgiveness. And I've heard suggestions from advocates lately that simplifying the forgiveness application and associated requirements for all PPP loans between 150,000 and 2 million would further allow a more streamlined process. And it has also been raised that additional resources may be needed to help the SBA expedite reviews for PPP loans greater than $2 million. So as the agency is beginning to move forward and move their focus from the origination phase to the forgiveness phase, what kind of considerations are being made uh, by you all to ensure that there is an efficient forgiveness process? Do you also feel that raising the current cap on PPP loans eligible for streamlined forgiveness from 150 to 2 million would help you better serve our businesses? Thank you for that. We are looking at best practices in that 150,000 and under range because clearly that simplicity um, is uh, is beneficial to our small businesses applying. Um, we do want to apply similar type, uh, you know, uh, streamlined processes for the 150 to 2 million, and are exploring uh, options currently. And so, would uh, you know, welcome a partnership in trying to uh, circle back with you once we have more specifics to recommend. Obviously, we're talking to lenders who have uh, been implementing PPP to understand what they're seeing and what they're hearing in terms of uh, you know, whether why borrowers are not uh, pursuing forgiveness at this time. But we know that that cliff is coming with payments due and want to make sure that we move forward uh, to create a system that they will access more readily. And I apologize for my dogs in the background. Uh, thank you. And I look forward to working with you on that as well. Uh, my next question has to do with uh, concerns that constituents in my community have been raising with me related to, and I recognize you are facing unique challenges with the pandemic, but with your agency being asked to distribute federal assistance to small businesses, uh, we are definitely hearing a lot more about customer service and the needs to have a more uh, effective customer service. What recommendations do you have to improve the customer experience during for those of us uh, in our communities who are seeking assistance from SBA? And some measures we put into place, but we I've asked my staff to be as entrepreneurial as the small businesses that we serve and, and obviously uh, we're providing strong customer uh, support and, and service is, is really critical for small businesses as they seek revenues every single day. Um, and so we've tried to take that approach um, you know, with our small businesses. Uh, they obviously need information easily. Um, yeah, accessible as well as, uh, you know, in, in simple terms. And so we've really been partnering externally with many organizations um, to better reach small businesses with authentic voices, uh, people who can help them navigate and translate government uh, to better support their needs. And in addition, we've equipped our field with more information and direct access to our programs uh, so that they can better support our small businesses and, and, and turn around these requests. Obviously, SBA has been inundated, but we're working to try to find better ways uh, with technology as well to streamline processes, including support uh, to give small businesses answers and uh, resources that they need ASAP. And I would look forward to working with you as well on that. It definitely is a, a trend that, uh, and I understand the volume that you are realizing right now with the with uh, PPP and IDLE and a number of other uh, large programs that you're implementing, uh, some more successfully than others. But if there's anything that our office or this, this committee can be doing to help you uh, as you work through what best practices are on customer service, I would welcome that as well. I only have a... Um, 
half a minute left. So I guess I would ask how we can be better supporting you on issues of fraud as well. Uh, if there's a 20 seconds worth of uh, ideas that you might have that we can help on the fraud area, that would be a welcome last uh, couple seconds. The SBA is continuing to, to use resources. We've obviously scaled up on customer service as well as um, our fraud team. And so that support, that financial support for extra administrative funds has been helpful for that. Um, and so that continued support will be uh, important going forward. Thank you. I've run out of time and I yield back, Madam Chair. Gentle lady yields back. And now we recognize the gentle lady from Texas, Ms. Van Dyne. Thank funding. you. Thank you very much, Chairman Velasquez. I very much appreciate the fact that she's um, called upon and recognized the importance of getting Secretary Yellen here to answer some of these most basic questions. Um, and I hope that we'll continue to push her and make sure that she does have an opportunity to speak directly to our, our committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Administrator Guzman, for being here today. You've been unable to answer or unprepared to answer a lot of the questions that have been proposed and, and, and posed to you by my colleagues specifically those um, proposed um, impacts of the current administration, the impacts of increasing the minimum wage. And, and are you familiar that NFIB has found that 92% of small business owners felt the wage mandate would harm their businesses? Um, I, you know, I am familiar. I know as well, though, that there's other studies that show that there's other, you know, there's other factors that are impacting the workforce and small businesses' ability to, to hire. Oh, without, without a doubt. I mean, including the enhanced unemployment benefits. I was surprised when you said that you hadn't heard that so much, that, that what you had heard from small business owners was their, their questioning of, of, of coming back in a safe environment. I think uh, Congresswoman Tinney was very clear that they have purchased and invested a lot of, of money into ways of making sure that they're coming back in a safe environment. So, you know, not, not being very clear about the unenhanced unemployment benefits and the effects that that's having on small businesses. They increase uh, on capital gains and the effects that that will have on small businesses you've been un unable to answer. And quite frankly, not having any information about what the increase in the corporate tax rate would have on small businesses, not just on the direct costs, but on the indirect costs. For example, increases in utility rates. Administrator Guzman, you are charged with running the Small Business Administration that was created to aid, counsel, assist, and protect small businesses. And yet you're not aware of many of the proposed increases and tax consequences that will directly affect small businesses that are coming out of this administration. I guess my question is, if you are not aware of the effects and the impacts of these policies that are coming down in the Biden administration, who is advising the administration for, and, um, for small businesses? Well, I mean, I know that, um, you know, as we've discussed this before, I've, I've said that President Biden's plan is really focused on closing those loopholes for the larger corporations. And and, and I will submit that. I, I, I give back my time. I, I, I disagree. It's not just, it's what it may be focused, but they're increasing the corporate tax rate. When asked, will that affect small businesses? What was your answer? On a very, only a very small percentage of uh, small businesses are C corporations. Like we talked about that. No, not, regardless of whether or not they're C corporations, will increased corporate tax rate affect small businesses? Again, I mean, the, the Biden's plan is focused on those who have uh, you know, earnings over four hundred thousand. And, and I understand. So yes, there will be small businesses that are included and, and in I, that. If the gentle lady, now, please allow the witness to answer the questions. If she answers the questions, I would really appreciate it. Look, I mean, the, the, the bottom line is that, you know, there are important provisions, uh, you know, President Biden has pledged to not only to not increase taxes on taxpayers earning less than $400,000 and, you know, including S corporation taxes. Yeah, all, of, all of the exceptions, as I said. I would really appreciate it if you would answer the question, what would be the impact? And I know it's not the focus, but there will be direct and indirect impacts on increasing our corporate tax rate, correct? On small businesses? Not on the smallest businesses. I mean, so again, on we're- small businesses on defined by your administration and by your department. I mean, things like increases in utility taxes and utility costs, those will be felt by small businesses, correct? 
small business, yes, small businesses will, um, you know, will continue to, um, you know, have to navigate, uh, you know, the systems in place and any increases that vendors might um, transfer to them. But, um, you know, again, uh, the focus on this tax reform is really to, you know, to ensure that those smallest, that there's a level playing field for the smaller entities. I appreciate that SBA um, supports all small businesses. You know, it could be as large as 500 employees. And so I reclaim uh, my on. 20 seconds left. It's obvious that small businesses that you're that you're speaking with aren't telling you what the rest of us across the country are hearing. I would welcome you. I would invite you to come down to Texas 24 in Dallas, Fort Worth and speak with the small businesses that we are talking to that will tell you what the problems are directly so that you can be more prepared. And maybe then when you can, when you are more prepared and you've heard directly from small businesses, you can circle back with this committee and let us know what we're doing to be able to, to really prepare and protect our small businesses across the country as these Biden administration policies are coming down. I yield back my time. Thank you very much. The gentle lady yields back, and now we recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Kim. But let me just uh, react to this line of questioning. First of all, the, the topic of this hearing is an examination of SBA COVID relief uh, programs. And uh, the gentle lady, the administrator, is prepared to answer the questions related to the implementation of those programs. There will be a time for us to hold a hearing on any tax policies, but this is not the space. And uh, I hope, uh, I think the um, taxpayers deserve uh, answers from the administrator as it relates to those programs that have been uh, implemented by uh, the current administration. And Madam now, Mr. Me, King. Let me some time in response to your comments there. Mm -hmm. Those tax questions are fair questions because we're talking about the COVID uh, activities and policies of this administration of, of the SBA and tax policy on those, on those new programs is very important. To have a basic understanding of the tax policies effect on small businesses will help us understand how these COVID policies, these COVID programs can be helpful. If we find out that there's more detrimental effect from the tax policy, we need to understand how that can affect the COVID policies, the COVID programs. They are very appropriate. It's unfortunate the, the administrator is unprepared today to answer basic questions about the administration's program. She is not representing the Small Business Administration at the table when the administration is talking about tax policy, which is extremely un, uh, uh, alarming because if she's not there, who is? Those well, are you, uh, questions we need to have answered because well, all of we, this factors into how we address the COVID problem in this country. I, I, I just um, wish that you were so forceful when we were uh, conducting oversight hearings with the previous administration as it related to the fact that ineligible businesses were able to get uh, assistance, uh, relief assistance that didn't qualify for. And uh, so with that, Mr. King. Time. We were, we were at the table. We contacted Secretary Mnuchin and said, hey, we got a problem. And immediately he took action. If you recall, he, re, he, he got in the middle of this and rescinded about $280 million worth of loans to people who, and the businesses that were ineligible. Yes, yeah. we were active on this and will continue to be, I can assure you. And we will continue to be active on tax policies and we will have Secretary Yellen at the table and uh, we will discuss those issues. But um, to be fair to the witness, um, the topic today is related to COVID-19 programs. Uh, Mr. Kim, now you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman and Administrator Guzman. Thank you uh, for taking some time to be able to come before our committee. The, I've been on this committee since my time in Congress and we certainly are trying to uh, to, to maintain a, the, the tradition of bipartisanship on this committee, this recognition that, that both parties are trying to do what they can to be able to support our small business. That's the reason why I wanted to stay on this committee because I felt like it was one of the few places in the last Congress where we were able to talk with each other civilly with respect and, and talk through a shared problem that we face with uh, small businesses going through some of the, the toughest challenges in modern history. And I know you have a lot 
on your plate and SBA has been working hard to be able to do this. Some places where it has not performed the way that I'd like, but other places where I understand that it's been a, a tough go. And, and one place I wanna just kind of hone in on is about the restaurant revitalization fund. Now I know that this has been moving forward, um, that you've been trying to take on some lessons learned from the launch of the Shuttered Venues Operators Grant Program as well. And I know that the application is something that has been tried to be simplified and easy to use so that restaurants are able to move forward with this. And especially when it comes to making the program accessible for the smallest independent restaurants and the socially disadvantaged business owners. I'm also aware that the SBA had to work within the rules set by Congress, including how the funding amounts are calculated. So you didn't have a lot of discretion to spread around the 28.6 billion uh, that we knew would not even come close to meeting the demand. Still, I'm very concerned to hear from businesses in my district, including socially disadvantaged businesses that are supposed to be prioritized, that their applications have been rejected without being provided a reason or an opportunity to correct errors. I worry that many of the most vulnerable businesses were that we're trying to help are being left out and that minor errors could mean that a business eligible for a very significant amount of money gets nothing while the next applicant in line gets the full amount. So I just want to ask, can you please explain how SBA is handling applications with minor errors or insufficient documentation? And will rejected applicants ever be told the reason, especially in the event that Congress provides more funding for the program and they may have an opportunity to reapply? Thank you. I, mean, I think the challenges with first in first out programs uh, is just that. And so obviously as, as uh, you know, businesses were allowed to um, get back in line and reapply, um, but that's obviously um, you know, depending on the, the level of uh, challenges in their application. I don't have specifics, so we'd have to review specific cases, um, you know, directly uh, in terms of why individuals were not, uh, were rejected from the program. Um, but I'm happy to, you know, put you in touch, uh, your team in touch with my team to make sure that we can work through those specific issues. Um, but SBA, you know, will be developing, you know, processes for, um, for businesses, if, if assuming that there's additional funds put in place for businesses to, you know, to reapply into the future. Well, you know, what I, I mean, look, I appreciate your willingness to help out. Um, but what I just want to emphasize again, if you can kind of take it back to your team, is is about just that that feedback. You know, when the businesses don't know what it is that has gone wrong, why it is that they're not being accepted. And, you know, we hear that from um, that kind of breakdown there in the communication, you know, we hear that also with, you know, the PPP, for instance, I know you addressed this to a, 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 a point, but, you know, I've also heard from these panic business owners waiting for PPP loans when they receive a notice that, you know, SBA will remove all loans you know, not in not approved and further research status from their origination platform by 5 p.m. on May 17th. You know, that that's something that they've received that notice. They get very panicked about it. And, you know, you know, we're, we're told that, you know, before that no applications were purged. I get it. But, you know, when we're looking at this, you know, Congress has approved more than $800 billion for the PPP program, which is funded more than, you know, 11.6 uh, million loans. The program has become a crucial lifeline for small businesses, but what we're trying to figure out is, you know, how are we, how is SBA addressing the confusion caused by that notice? And how are we working to resolve these remaining hold codes, complete all pending applications and utilize the remaining amount before June 30th? So this is just something that I'm continuing to hear as their problem. Yeah, and, and we did definitely notice the banks so that they could take action as all of those hold codes were you know, a minimum over 30 days, um, you know, some case over 90 days. And so they needed to take action on those loans. We did, again, we did not um, remove them from the system in any way. And so they can continue to work through those issues with the SBA if those were actual pending um, loans that they intended to take action on. So, uh, you know, I, I definitely uh, appreciate that we need to have more communication. Um, that is a goal um, as we continue to look through improvements in the program. And so I will take it back with my team and see how we can improve um, that transparency as we move forward without- you Just know, letting them know, just communicating what they need to do to resolve it. That's time, really what it comes down to. Time has uh, expired. Uh, now we recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Donalds. 
Uh, thank you, Chairwoman, uh, Ranking Member, for this, uh, this actually quite lively committee. You know, first of all, uh, Administrator uh, Guzman, I'll tell you, you know, having coached young kids, I always tell them the number one ability is availability. So I want to thank you for making yourself available. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, Secretary Yellen does not know that the best ability is availability. And so she needs to be here to answer these questions. Uh, I'll tell you, um, Administrator, I mean, I get it why you can't, you know, frankly, keep it 100 with the American people about President Biden's uh, uh, tax policies and other economic policies because you'd be in trouble with your boss. So I understand why you can't, you know, be 100 about those things. But what most people don't know is that my career was actually as a, a bank underwriter, as a credit loan underwriter for many years. So I underwrote small business loans. And I'll tell you uh, 100% that uh, increases in the corporate tax rate, increases in the capital gains rate are going to affect small businesses, whether you are C-Corp or a pass-through uh, S-Corp. Uh, simply because that's what happens with increased taxes. Either it's going to hurt them directly on their bottom line or it's going to hurt the people that they do business well with, that it's going to impact them as well. Uh, so just for the record, as somebody who's actually uh, been a lender that's dealt with SBA from the front lines, I will tell you point blank, increased tax policy is going to hurt small businesses across the United States. Uh, that being said, you know, I know that in the last uh, uh, spending bill that was passed in Congress, there was a change to PPP, which expanded uh, the ability for nonprofits, uh, spe specifically large nonprofits, to access PPP loans. Um, one of the concerns uh, by myself and other members of the committee was that nonprofits like Planned Parenthood and their affiliates would be able to gain access to the PPP program. Um, has, to this point, has any nonprofit like uh, Planned Parenthood uh, or their affiliates received PPP loans? Uh, it's the SBA's long-standing policy not to comment on specific borrowers, uh, but yes, there have been over 80,000 uh, nonprofits who have access to uh, this system. Uh, is there an ability for uh, this committee to be able to get an understanding of what nonprofits have gained access? Can you provide that to us? We have provided specific reports um, of all the loans, and so that information is readily available to you if you were um, to search through the system, yes. All right, we'll and definitely we'll make sure, sure we, has it. Mm -hmm. we'll make sure we definitely look into that. Uh, real quick, I want to piggyback off of something that uh, the ranking member was talking about in the IDLE program. Uh, you said that it's really not something that uh, frontline lenders want to do is get involved in the IDLE program. It's not really in their incentive base to do so. Um, have you guys actually itemized or estimated the amount of total fraud in the IDLE program to this point? Uh, there have been estimates from the IG, um, and we are still working through. I mean, as an example, I mean, but real quick, because I got two minutes. So, what's that yeah. number? What's what's that number? Can you tell us? As an example, on identity theft, it's less than one percent of actual cases. Uh, but we continue to work through all those flagged issues with the IG and. I mean, how much? Program. But how much money are we talking about? Give me dollars, dollars and cents. I like I like percentages too, but dollars and spent in cents. How much are we talking about? Mm -hmm. We don't have final numbers in terms of the total fraud picture yet as we continue to investigate. Let me answer this question. Do you think it would probably be cheaper for the United States taxpayer, taxpayer to incentivize lending institutions to administer idle uh, as opposed to paying out money uh, in fraudulent means? That calculate, we'd have to work through that together. So I, I welcome an opportunity. All right, quick question. I mean, you're the administrator now. Don't you think that's a worthwhile calculation to perform? Once we, yes, once we get the final calculation of what the actual fraud is on the program, especially knowing that we've implemented new controls going forward that were not allowed uh, in the in previous year, um, then, then of course we can look at that trend. All right, real quick. Last thing I want to ask, really want to ask you about is, um, there's also been a point in this committee that um, under Administrator McMahon, the response time um, from, a, from a SBA was actually very, very prompt even though they were still trying to dig out new information. Um, you're the administrator now, so quick, what changed? Why have we gone from quick response times to no, to very slower, non-existent response times? Uh, the, you know, I, I don't know what the Administrator Carranza's uh, response times were during disaster, but obviously the team is highly impacted um, in terms of their ability to respond um, quickly as possible. We have the- But Administrator, the responded. pandemic was last year too, and the pandemic is ending this year. So I'm trying to understand what this, what's the difference in response time between last year and this year? My understanding is that the comparison between uh, the previous administration, Administrator Carranza, who was in, um, you know, in position during COVID, 
uh, versus my uh, my time here is that we've been very transparent. Uh, we've tried to respond as quickly as possible, and by expediting these briefings, uh, live briefings, as well as reports um, that we've been sharing with you, that that has, um, in addition, provided you with more information than in the previous time. All right, are you all back? Fired. Now we re uh, recognize the gentle lady from Minnesota, Ms. Craig. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Velasquez. And um, I'd, I'd like to thank you for being here, uh, Administrator Guzman. I, I, for the record, uh, I think you are exactly the right person to be testifying as a witness in front of us today uh, about the SBA's COVID relief program since you are uh, the administrator of the Small Business Administration. So, you know, I, I wanna thank you. Um, and everyone at the SBA. And, and I'd like to thank those who worked in the previous administration with the Small Business Administration, because it's all of your hard work over the last year, obviously in, in implementing the various mostly bipartisan programs um, that this committee approved in the last Congress. It was an extraordinary challenge during a public health crisis. And um, at the end of the day, uh, we're here to make sure that as many of our small businesses as possible can get through this crisis. And of course, uh, we're going to learn uh, as we go in a public health emergency. So um, shame on anybody here today who would turn this into a partisan exercise. Um, I especially want to uh, commend uh, the administrator on the creation and implementation of the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. In, in fact, I would like to thank my colleagues from across the aisle for those of you who supported that. I've been a proud advocate of this program since the Restaurants Act was introduced in the last Congress, and I was incredibly pleased to see this get across the finish line when it was included in the American Rescue Plan. Just last week, I heard from one of my constituents, uh, the owner of uh, Tawakal Restaurant, located in uh, the great city of Burnsville, who told me that they have already received uh, financial assistance from the RRF. I'm pleased to see that these vital funds being dispersed to our hardest hit small businesses are going out so quickly to some. However, uh, you know there's another side of this. In terms of the RRF applicants, such as Nick's Diner in Cannon Falls, um, I'm really disappointed to learn that the likelihood of uh, that independent restaurant receiving assistance is incredibly small. As some of my colleagues before me have mentioned, the RRF does not currently have enough money to as assist many uh, of its applicants. That's why I'm working on leading a group of my colleagues and pushing house leadership to replenish the program to fulfill current demand or as many of those independent restaurants who've taken the, the brunt of this public health crisis. Uh, literally, our government asked them to shut down during a public health crisis. We need to work together to uphold our ongoing commitment and replenish this fund. Uh, Administrator Guzman, you noted in your testimony that the RF program has received more than 362,000 applications with a total of 75 billion in funding requested. At the current funding level, is there a possibility a large number of those applicants could miss out on receiving any of those grant dollars? Yes, there will be significant demand unmet. Um, at the close of this program once awards are finalized. Administrator, is there any estimate or prediction on how many of those applicants uh, are not going to receive any of those grant dollars at this time? Um, not the specific numbers as they work through the specific applications and the dollar amounts for each. Um, obviously, we had the $9.5 billion and set aside to the smaller entities. Uh, but uh, the latest numbers are over $76 billion in applied and with only $28.6 billion available, there will be a significant um, number of those 372,000 applicants. Uh, Administrator, do, do you think that Congress should strongly consider replenishing uh, this program? The program has been uh, effective at uh, reaching out and, and uh, to support small businesses, restaurants, food and beverage businesses broadly. Um, there's a, obviously a large pool of applicants who are interested in this grant funding. 
Um, and these are the hardest hit industries that are big job creators in our economy. Uh, and so providing that support to them is really critical. And uh, whatever uh, Congress moves forward with, we would be um, you know, uh, more than willing to implement as expediently as possible. Um, thank you so much for that answer. And, and from that, I'm going to assume your answer is yes. Are you open to working with this committee and leadership to explore uh, replenishing the RRF? We would be happy to collaborate and provide any information and intel that can better inform that decision, yes. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Gentle lady yields back. Uh, again, uh, Administrator Guzman, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your testimony and your service to our nation's small businesses. I am also grateful for SBA's responsiveness the increased level of transparency and receptiveness for information has not gone on, on notice. I commend you for being more forthcoming with this committee. With that said, you have taken over the helm of SBA as one of the, at one of the most critical times in its history, and the road to recovery will be a long and winding one for small businesses. Your testimony has also given us much to think about and add a look at the obstacles that small business relief programs face. It is important to remember that our program is perfect and we must help them operate as effectively as possible. This hearing has made clear that there is much work to be done and I look forward to partnering with you on all these efforts. I welcome your continued engagement, particularly as we look to reauthorize the SBIR STTR programs. I would ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit state and unsupporting materials for the record. Without objection, so ordered. I mean, there is no further business to come before the committee. We are adjourned. Thank you.